thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know. I'm really excited about it. It it worked out perfect being on like launch day because I like after this, I'm going to go celebrate with some friends. So <laughs> awesome. So let's jump right into it. Right. So you said celebration day. So let's start there. I have no agenda here. This is just <laughs> let's get your story and let's help people understand how insidious, terrible and hellish abuse can be and how beautiful and wonderful things can be on the other side and how healing can occur. So you just said it's launch day. Tell everybody what you mean. Yeah, so I, um, after launching uh, Speak Your Truth over a year ago, uh, we have a ton of information and resources available in the, the private Facebook group. But um, it's really hard to navigate because Facebook groups aren't super user friendly. So I consolidated all that information and more created more um, like how you can help type stuff for people who don't know about abuse, um, but have friends that have gone through it or want to teach their children how to avoid those relationships. So I've put that all into a website and spent the last four months working on it. Countless hours. I've been up really late for oh my gosh so many weeks yeah so so it's launch day and launched the website we also started an instagram and a pinterest that i'm going to try to keep up with so i'm very excited about it awesome so we're gonna have to link to that obviously and then yeah. i got a link to it on the website and like i was saying the other day awesome yeah. so when you say you launched the website the website is it's speakyourtruth.today all right, so here's how Hannah and I know each other. About a year ago, I saw this article where Hannah very candidly shared her story and what happened during her years of marriage. And then attached to it is, I don't even remember if like, hey, join this Facebook group or whatever, right? And I had been working on this program for helping people recognize abusive situations, understand how to deal with them, and then ultimately heal from them when they're ready to, to move to that point. And so this was the perfect group to join. And Hannah wrote this article with no intentions whatsoever, other than, hey, this is, I'm sharing my truth, right? Yeah. So tell everybody, oh, let me finish that and then we'll get to that. So anyway, join this Facebook group and 17,000 people later, Hannah's launching a website to even further help people and broaden her reach. It's unreal. So let's, do you want to start with the article? Do you want to start with growing up? Where do you want to start? Yeah, um, I can start with the article. Um, it kind of ties into where I grew up. I, I grew up in like a really small town. Um, everyone gets married really young. It's very normalized. Uh, it's like your, your typical cute small farm town. And um, lots of, there, we used to have the record for how many churches you could have like per capita in my small town yeah so um was I it, this wasn't Oregon was it it was Washington? Uh, where Washington, Washington. yeah yeah. Washington. Okay. yeah yeah a little town called Linden and um and it was great I have a, a great family my parents are amazing and um and that was part of the uh, community that I was trying to reach with my original post that I shared um, on my birthday in 2019, February 10th. Um, I I went through a three and a half year abusive marriage, and I had no idea that I was experiencing abuse until after I left. Um, there was a lot of reasons why I didn't uh, connect that what I was experiencing was abuse, but um, a lot of that boils down to just plain not being educated. And so uh, I knew after leaving, I, I learned about the statistics, the one in four women and one in seven men will experience violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. And that really hit me. And, and I just thought about all the people in my hometown who like, it's very hush hush, like all the yeah. like families are glorified. And, and, um, and so in marriage, like getting married young is very common and divorce is really looked down upon. And so I knew it was happening in my hometown. And so that was kind of my uh, push to to make that 
a post. I also felt like, you know, I, I was one of the first people that got married in, I got married at 20, uh, almost 21. And one of the first people in my class to get married, uh, I had a class of like 82 students or whatever. And now almost, I think 60 or 70% of them are married. A lot of them are married already. Uh, and I'm only, I'm only 25 now. Uh, a lot of them have kids already. So it's very normalized. But um, I, you know, at the, at the point uh, I was, we were almost uh, finished with our divorce process by February, 2019. We got divorced in, in March. And I felt like I need, I was taking my name back because my, my married name, I didn't want to keep it obviously. So I chose to take my, my maiden name back um, and knew that this small town of mine, it, it was going to be the talk of the town, you know? So I, you know, partly wanted to um, clear things up and, and tell my story in a way that um, I felt like was telling the the truth of, of what happened, but I also like very very um, strongly wanted to speak out against the abuse that I knew was happening in my uh, small town. And um, and yeah, so it's funny that you you like found it right when you were trying to you were making this program right for people to identify it well that was like exactly what I wanted to do in my original post that the, the biggest portion of of my post that I think really hit strongly with a lot of people was the part where I said you know if they do this that's manipulation and abuse if they do this because there's so many like people think abuse is just hitting it's not it's not it's not <laughs> So, yeah. Um, so that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. Cause I mean, there was even dating relationships that I had that, uh, growing up like in high school and stuff that I don't, you know, there, there's things that, that kids just aren't taught yeah. and parents, I think, think that they will learn it over time or how to, you know, how to, just because you show, like my parents have a wonderful relationship, just because you can show that you have a wonderful relationship doesn't mean your kids are going to understand how to do that themselves yeah. when they get into relationships. There's, you have to speak about it and show. There's both those things. So, so that's one of the coolest things about the website, speakyourtruth.today, is Hannah's put together resources for helping children learn what abuse looks like, right? I haven't looked at each individual resource, but it's helping the kids understand what abuse looks like. And it's helping parents understand how to talk to their children. And it's age appropriate. Hannah's got it broken out. So here's how to talk to elementary school kids mm -hmm. about abuse prevention. Here's how to talk to middle school and high school. These conversations are not had. And many people like you, Hannah, the people that I coach and counsel and the situations that I've observed, it takes a dog long time to figure out that what you're experiencing is abuse. So yeah. at what point did you hit that realization? This is not normal. This goes yeah. beyond some like bad juju in the relationship. Something's not right. Yeah. Yeah. So the first time I think I really, uh, kind of learned that what I was experiencing wasn't normal. I opened up to a friend. I, so my ex was in the military. We were stationed in Georgia. And so in Georgia, I opened up to a friend uh, and my ex and I were kind of in the middle of an argument, but I had separated and I had gone and done something with my friend and I was actually very scared to go home because I didn't know what I was going home to. Yep. And so I opened up to her and I, I almost started crying and, you know, said that, you know, my ex and I weren't doing well and, and asked her that like, if I needed a place to stay, is it okay if I stay here, they had an extra bedroom. And she, you know, was like, of course, and then asked me more questions about it. And the previous night my ex had uh gotten angry about something and all i remember is he he uh pushed me onto a couch and as i was falling back i kind of um 
like grabbed his shirt like as I, I was kind of like I think I was grabbing it to like try to not fall or something I don't know yeah, but right just grasping at something yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I ripped the the collar of his shirt and then he went up and and ripped my my shirt into and when he did that he left like a tiny little scratch mark and um and I didn't even tell her that part I all I told her was when he when he pushed me back, I actually sat on a phone charger or something and broke it. And so I had, that's what I told her. I said that he had, he had pushed me onto the couch and, and I broke the phone charger and she was very concerned and, and said something, asked me something like, Hannah, do you ever feel unsafe? And I like had to stop and, and think about it for a while. And then I told her, I said, you know, if I have to think about it, I don't think that's a good sign. That was such a good question. I'm going to write that one down, honestly. Great. Yeah. Do you ever feel yeah. unsafe? And that's what I always tell people too. It was a fantastic question because it made me realize that like I should always feel safe mm -hmm. in my relationship. I should never be afraid and so that was a pivotal moment. That was probably about a month and a half before I left. Uh, and yeah, so when I did leave, I had one more, well, I, I had a lot of times after that when friends spoke to me, but, uh, and encouraged me in a way that I knew what I was experiencing was abuse. But um, the kind of the first time after that was I had chosen to leave, I packed up, um my stuff and I had friends that were about um two hours away that drove to me and, and helped me drive to their house to stay at their house for about five days before I flew out to um here in LA I live in Orange County now um because I have a huge community here I, I went to college here so even though my my parents and my family still live up in Washington so they came and helped me uh, move to third place just for that temporary time. But in the car, my, my ex was still messaging me. I hadn't blocked him on anything yet. We were just, you know, he, he said he wanted a divorce so many times. Um, and, and so when I was leaving, he had said we had gotten an argument before and he was like, we're, we're going to get a divorce. Like I'm going to get the house. You can have whatever. And, and so I had actually like kind of taken him seriously that time and, and stayed at a, a friend's house local in town that night. And then the next morning went and and I didn't really tell him anything. I just said I was leaving and he was all upset. I don't think he believed that I was actually going to leave. I had this pre-planned trip that worked really well to come out to LA. And then I just changed my re return flight. Um, so when I was in the car with my friend, she we were reading text messages of what he was saying because he, he kind of realized. Anyways, he was blaming, blaming everything on me. And I, and I, I, shared with her what he was saying. I don't remember what exactly he said, but she said, Hannah, that's really manipulative. And that was another like first time when I was like, I could see it then, like after that, you know, like I, before like people pointed it out to me, I thought he was very troubled. And I thought, um, all of these things, you know, he, he had experienced abuse as a child. And so, uh, I had so much compassion and, and love for him, but, um, but yeah, when she said that's really manipulative, I could see how he was trying to manipulate me rather than before. I don't think I ever. It's like yeah. the scales fall off your eyes. Right. And suddenly. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Right. So what were some of the things that were happening all through the relationship that you did? think about that really were abuse yeah yeah so in my original post I made a, um, a very strong point to uh, bring up the seemingly small um, things that people might not think about so uh, like pushing onto soft things or blocking uh, exits or or doorways um, or 
like taking your keys, not letting you leave or throwing things. Um, like that happened all the time. And I never saw it as abuse because he wasn't physically hurting me. Yeah. Um, I always thought abuse was physical. And so, and then there was, of course, so many emotional and psychological things that he was doing as well. He was, um, you know, I, I, he was never diagnosed, obviously, but I strongly believe he's a narcissist and um, was always the victim. Uh, he, he was never at fault. Everything was blamed on me. Um, for anything I, I was telling That's my it. now friend in the car um yesterday he had forgotten something and we had gone all the way across town and then we had to go all the way back to get whatever he needed for school and I just it kind of hit me like I told him I said dude if I had done this with my ex yeah. like he would have had a heyday like it would have been all hell would have broke loose. And he was like, what do you mean? Like if he forgot something, he would blame it on you. And I was like that too. <laughs> exactly. But, that too. That exactly. No yeah. matter what happened, no matter who technically was responsible, it was your fault and all hell would have broken loose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a great example of that. There was one time when we went out with friends the night before or something and I had his phone charger in my purse. Okay. I keep my purse in the same place. Like I have a little hook that I put it on and the next morning his phone was almost dead and he got so, I think the night before he had asked me to go get his phone charger or something like that and I had totally forgotten and then the next morning his phone was almost dead and he oh got so upset was storming around the house and and you know making messes and before going off to work because you know how could I not remember that makes him feel like I don't care about him and that yes. you know like little I, things not important yeah there it is yep little things are big things for the abuser because it attacks their ego the yeah. core driving force for any narcissist any abuser and we'll get back to narcissists in a second the core driving factor for all of them and, and driving force is to never feel weak inadequate or worth less and anything that makes them feel worth less than they are right now attacks the ego and so something like that you didn't do for me. It's his freaking phone, right? You're responsible. It was your, and that's an, what we call narcissistic injury, right? You've injured the ego to such a degree. So that's why there's no little things with abusers. And to your yeah. point of you think he's a narcissist, but probably never diagnosed. I have come to the firm conclusion, according to the DSM and the technical guidelines of diagnosing somebody with narcissism, right? It's a very small percentage of people that ever are. Mm. There are at least, in my opinion, five times as many abusers running out there who have narcissistic tendencies as there are narcissists, narcissists who get diagnosed. So mm. just because somebody's not technically a narcissist, according to the DSM coding of that, doesn't mean they're not an abuser. So when somebody like a professional within the industry says, you know, there are very few narcissists, you can say, yeah, but there are a lot of freaking abusers because there yeah. are. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the statistics can't or don't lie. Like they, like one in four women and one in seven men is a massive part of our, yeah, it's insane. And I didn't really make the connection until the other day that, that, you know, we have like uh, over 17,000 members on our site and I didn't really make the connection that oh, wait, like that means that there's 17,000 abusers, <laughs> like, right. and, you know, like that's insane. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I would bet that some of those are repeat offenders. There's no doubt. Yeah. There's yeah. no doubt. But this the, the point that Hannah's making, that you're making, is so true that there are at least 17,000 abusers out there. At yeah. least. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's wild and it's so saddening and and so that's why a huge like passion of mine is abuse prevention because I feel like so many organizations are doing amazing jobs but are super spread thin on uh, on reaction you know yeah. health 
a survivor afterwards or uh but the preventative side is is still very young figuring out how you teach children um these things it really so that that brings us back to the the elementary middle school and high school um talk on on my website i it's mainly educating them on consent like that's okay. essentially what is most important um consent and, and helping boys and girls know when to say no and and that they can say no yeah. um is super important and so that and then um it's it's all mixed in there but you you can start teaching children about consent as young you know as like one years old it's, yeah. it's you know, yeah. how how do they know and you're not just talking sexual consent you're talking right. consent to what happens in their life boundaries right you're teaching them mm -hmm. boundaries as young as one years old yeah yeah, yeah. boundaries yeah uh as far as like what they want or need emotionally, but also physically, something that I think is really interesting that I was looking into when I was making these, uh, they're little downloadable PDFs. So you can go to the website and download a PDF according to the age of your children. And I, when I was researching them, it was interesting that, um, that uh, the way that you teach children about consent uh kind of is completely different than what you would think about raising children because i mean oftentimes you want to love and hug the kids and and squeeze them and and tickle them and stuff like that but what i was reading was you know let's take a step back and you know many people don't like hugs don't um aren't all about physical touch if grandma wants to you know kiss your face she's got ass first you know so yeah. it's it's interesting um but it's like that young age especially little girls i feel like you know everyone's touching their hair and everyone's uh, yeah. it's it's very normalized to um to you know affectionately uh touch children and, and love love them um but there's that creates confusion i think growing up on what is okay but not okay um uh if you don't agree with it you know i i was never educated on consent and that i even have a choice really and mm -hmm. and it, someone wants to hug me like i have to accept it you know but but it is uh, you do have a choice, you know, it's your body and you get to choose what you do with it. So, yeah. It's such an important conversation about boundaries and understanding that as a father, I have five kids. And the first time I read something about um, it can be damaging when the child says, stop tickling me and you don't, I was thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, right. You know, they say that, but really we're still having fun. And then it, it really did hit me. There, there is a point and some of it is in good nature and it's what we do, parents and kids, right? Stop, stop, stop. But if there is a point where we're not heeding that, what are we teaching them? Yeah. That their opinion, their thoughts, their desires don't matter. And I, the authority figure, will get to dictate. And that is part of exactly why we get into abusive situations when we get older. You're exactly yeah. right, Hannah. So yeah. good on prevention. Yeah. You're right. That's a huge need is the prevention. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that there are several um, states that are implementing, you know, uh, teaching, uh, like more thorough teachings on consent um, and sexual education or se sex education um, in schools. But a lot of a lot of places are really, really far behind. I think Europe is is better in that than us. <laughs> I think they have better. Um, uh, education in that area yeah that, that very well could be yeah <laughs> so you recognized toward the end of the relationship the little things that were happening were really a problem yeah that him putting little things into motion to create big things was actually abuse and manipulation and mm -hmm. what were some of the things he would say what were some of the other things he would do yeah 
Yeah. So something that I say a lot is that he, he asked for a divorce all the time. And that was something that, yeah, was, it was, and it always happened, you know, near the end of the argument when he was clearly, you know, I, I was not bending to his will or whatever, whatever he wanted, you know? So it was, it was a way for him to make me take ownership of everything that was wrong and, you know, basically beg him to t retract those those words take those words back because obviously I didn't want to get a divorce I didn't believe in divorce so um yes yeah, think, so think about it what better way to be in control of a relationship than to dangle the ending of the relationship so that the other person will do whatever it takes to preserve it yeah I mean, it's such a huge power play and it's so consistent so anybody yeah. that watches this video please understand that is so consistent across the board, abusers love to dangle their approval. They love to dangle the health of the relationship. They love to throw out accusations against you so that you have to show them that those aren't true. They love to accuse you of cheating on them so that you have to lavish mm -hmm. praise and attention on them to show that your only interest is them. They get such a kick out of it because their ego is so fulfilled by that. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, he, um, and then another thing that, he was awful about was everything had to be his idea or his way <laughs> um, he really didn't like if i if i planned something i had to remind him about four or five times before whatever it was you know there was one i remember there was one right. time my friends had planned like a whole get together with all of the women and our husbands and I had reminded him several times but then the the night before he decided to go out drinking with his his buddies yeah. and and didn't uh you know he had agreed that he was going to come home um and then we were going to because I was like because we're going tomorrow you know kind of thing and and he didn't come home that night. And then the next morning when I was getting ready before going out there, I'm like, where the heck are you? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that turned into a huge thing because, uh, you know, he should be able to go out with his friends and he didn't even want to, you know, come do this thing. And, and uh, he, something about, you know, he, I didn't remind him a couple days before something like that. And, and what was so frustrating was, cause that was, that was a common thing that I, I needed to remind him of these different things, uh, events and stuff like that. And, and I had created, I had synced our Gmail accounts. So like our Gmail calendar, I like my Gmail calendar is all color coordinated. Like I'm very organized mm -hmm. and I begged him to use this calendar so that he would, and he was like, no, I'm not going to use that. No, I'm not going to use that. I'm like, then you, you know, we wouldn't have this problem, but he, he wanted to be able to do what he wanted and so that was and then you know i'm seen as the controlling one because yes. yeah and if he ever planned something and you didn't want to do it what would happen yeah so um what's interesting about my abuser compared to a lot of other people's abusers is that he was actually um not socially abusive okay. so he could go out with his friends he actually enjoyed me not being there um and he he also like if i was to go out with my friends he'd be like cool you know it was a way for like him to have control over um uh, he, or he felt like when i was around i was controlling him or something like that so so he um if he planned something and I didn't want to do it, he would, he would probably be fine going, going and doing it by itself. He was all about being the center of attention. And so he would go out with his buddies like all the time. Um, there were several times when he, um, he did things at our house that I maybe wasn't okay with. And I just had to kind of roll with it because it was what he wanted to do. He, he, would get really obsessive over um, certain hobbies. It was like very strange. Yeah. That's so he got a common thing too. Very yeah. About, oh yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Very obsessive about certain things. Yes. Yeah. So, and it, it was ridiculous because he was horrible with money and, and luckily we had our bank account separate for a long time, but he was not, he, I mean, he would like spend paycheck to paycheck essentially because he would get all interested in all of these different hobbies. So at the, you know, when we first moved to Georgia, it was like he got super into woodworking or whatever. And so he built a lot of our furniture and um, and like purchased all of these tools, you know, and then and then it turned into um, this uh, beer brewing. And so he had to get all these materials for beer brewing. He got super obsessive over that. And then after that, it turned to, he, he decided to build a computer. He said it was for me and for my, cause I'm a graphic designer and I work, I work from home part-time. So, so this computer was supposed to be for me, but none of it was anything that I wanted. He didn't ask me anything that I wanted and he yeah. swore up and down. He, I mean, we had so many arguments about the stupid computer. I... <laughs> I am a Mac person because that typically designers go with Mac and uh, an Apple because they sync together really well and pro the programs work well on them. And mm. he was, he, you know, he thought it was all because I needed it to look pretty and, and, you know, this was going to be so much more useful and blah, blah, blah. And I remember telling him at, at one point, I mean, we had so many arguments about it, but I remember telling him like, this computer isn't for me. Like it's for you. You keep saying it's for me, but it's not for me. It's for you. It's like, you're going to, you're going to play your video games on it. Cause he was all about his video games. And, um, and he was like, no, I'm, I'm, you know, if I was going to make it for my video games, then I would have done this, this and this and it. And, and then afterwards, like after he finally completed it, I mean, he spent all day, every day, like on that computer playing video games. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I didn't want to interrupt you, but when you said oh, yeah. you had so many arguments about this computer, it just rings so true with so many people who have been in those situations. And there's that yeah. one thing that you have to have this argument over, over and over. And they love to do things for other people that are really just, and yeah. yeah. And when they get so into something, you bet, like the brewing equipment, they don't go halfway. It's gotta be all the stuff, right? And it can't be just the starter kit. No. We're gonna go all the way, cause we're gonna do this right. And then a couple months later, we're on to something else. And yeah. I can totally see based on, again, the folks that I talk to, just how consistent this all is. And the computer, if it were for me, I'd do this. And there's also yeah. that projection in there I don't know if you caught that, but there's that projection of, oh, you only want it because of this reason, Hannah. You want this because of the, because it looks cool. He's yeah. telling you what you want and why you want it. it yeah. That's a classic sign of abuse and manipulation is telling you what you want and why you want it and projecting that onto you that's not even there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, why people start to question themselves and their own intent. And they wonder, am I the abuser? Because you get yeah. washed. You get that brainwash like that. Yeah. There's two other ways that came to mind that he would, small ways that he would manipulate and abuse me um, that I think a lot of people don't really think about. One way was he would bring up past arguments uh, around friends mm. and try to kind of get people on his side or he would jokingly, jokingly make fun of me about something in front of people. And it was very upsetting to me. And I had to kind of roll with it because we were with friends and, um, or we would kind of go back and forth in, um, in front of friends because, you know, what he was saying wasn't accurate or whatever on purpose so that, you know, I looked like I was trying to make a fight when he was just making a joke or whatever, you know? So that was one way. And, and I see that in, in, you know, friendships now, unfortunately, like I can see um, certain couples like really struggling because yes. that is fine. Like when they get in arguments in front of, or, or nitpick at each other in front of other people, like, what's happening behind closed doors is going to be a thousand times worse than that. Yeah. So 
that's one thing. And then another thing that he would do, he wasn't socially abusive, like um, controlling over where I could go, but inside the home, he was extremely controlling and how I could talk to him. Mm -hmm. So if I was, and, and what he like our, our gender roles, kind of like what I did as a wife and what he did as a husband, like um, chores wise. And so that was another thing that uh, I didn't see as abuse because uh, like we would get in these little arguments about either the way I was speaking to him or how I didn't ask him in the right way or, or you know, I was interrupting whatever he was doing or I didn't say please. And so um, all of those things, you know, makes me feel like, oh, like I need to, you know, be better at um, uh, not making him feel this way or that way and but yeah it's really just blaming everything on me <laughs> this is why i did that article a couple of months ago five reasons why traditional counseling and advice don't work in a toxic relationship yeah because you start to question like you said yourself oh i need to change i need to do something different and counselors will usually go with the behavioral based approach you act your way toward getting where you want to be and so what would happen, let's just kind of play this out. If you were to go to yeah. counseling with your ex, they would say, well, Hannah, is it worth investing in him enough to speak to him in a way that resonates with him? Because you know, we each have a different way. And you would say, of course it is. Yes, you bet. And you'd be all interested to do that. Well, the problem yeah. is the counselor didn't ask about the 1500 ways you've tried to say it right 1500 times before. And each time it was wrong. And yeah. was it you or was it somebody else? I can't remember if it was on the Facebook Live we did with the group the other night or if it was somebody else. They were saying, at first it was, you don't ask me at the right time. Then it was, you don't ask yeah. me the right way. And then it was, you didn't say please. Was that you talking about? Yeah. 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 Right? So yeah. there's always, the goalpost is always moving. First, yeah. it's you didn't do this right. Then you do that right. And it's no, you didn't do it long enough. Okay. Then you do it long enough. But you didn't do it this way that I also needed. And you should have known that. Or yeah. I told you that before when you're like, what in the world? Yeah. So insidious. This is why I get so wound up about it like this, right? All the time when I talk about this, because I know how confusing it is to be in the middle of that situation. And anybody watching the video, anybody that benefits from this, I want them to understand you're not the crazy one. That spinning up that happens and that craziness and that confusion and that wondering, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. is because you're being abused. Yeah. Right. I wish I could look people in the eyes and let them know it's because you're being abused. And I, that question again, do you feel safe? Mm -hmm. That's why the questionnaire you've got at your website, the questionnaire I've got at my website are so helpful for people to like the scales to fall off their eyes, I hope, and see this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. This is abuse. And that's, yeah. Anyway, I get so, it, that <laughs> work through those seven steps that I talked about. First, you have to recognize what abuse is, then you have to name it, and you have mm -hmm. to really accept that that's what's happening before you can ever move toward the healing part. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's interesting um, that naming it, I mean, it, it's so important to name it what it is, um, because that, uh, I, I say that in our website, it's very important for friends and family members of victims and survivors to call it what it is because that further empowers the victim that they have been treated wrongly yes. and um and it isn't normal and because it's not normal they don't they don't have to put up with it they do don't have to yeah so anyways i love the the naming it part i i read um uh, trauma and recovery. Have you read that one? Yeah, no. That's by um, Judith Herman, and she has several steps to recovery. And one of them, I believe, is is calling it what it is. Um, like even you know when I was out and I was going through trauma therapy, I had a really hard time calling what my ex did to me the the first night we were together as rape like it was really really hard to call it rape because I don't want to be you know a statistic I don't want to um be someone who's been raped you know but um but calling it what it is uh is really really important because 
it not only empowers the victim, but it, it you know, convicts the, the abuser of what they have done, so. So let's turn to, you mentioned trauma therapy. So yep. you wrote the article and it was hilarious what you shared with me about like posting it. <laughs> yeah. So you had it ready to go, but you kind of posted on a bit of a whim. Yeah. <laughs> and within five hours, the post blew up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I had written out the post uh, several months prior. I had kind of, it was kind of a brain dump. Um, I, I forget when it was like, I think I had spent that day by myself and, and I had been thinking about all these things, you know, what, what can I do to, to kind of um, take my name back, tell my story, but also um, speak out ab about abuse. Um, but yeah, so I had written it like, I think in November or December and then um, February, my birthday rolls around and I decided to post it. And I had been out with my um, my boyfriend's family, and I was getting lots of drinks spot for me, and and my post was blowing up, and I was just it was wild, but yeah, yeah, it was fun. And so then, the Facebook group starts because three days later you said you wanted a place for folks to be able to come, share their stories, feel the camaraderie of people who have been there. Mm -hmm. You want to help people feel safe, right? Yeah. So then within a year, because of your work and some fabulous admins that work on that page, my goodness, yeah. they're amazing. I know. It's to 17 and a half thousand members. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. in that time, from the time you post it till now, I want you to help people understand what you've done to get to healing, to get to a place of emotional yeah. wholeness. Because I had somebody say to me, a client, okay, your videos are great they help people recognize abuse that they and they didn't use these words but basically mm -hmm. they were saying okay the, the videos you've done are great helping people recognize things and helping them understand what's going on but man you have to know that there's a better vista on the other side of this there is healing mm -hmm. on the other side and yeah. These yeah. Practices, like come on dude tell us about the healing stuff and yeah <laughs> so tell everybody what you've done in this last year to get where you are yeah. Yeah, so when I posted, I was still, I think I had started trauma therapy by then. I, I had started going to a therapist around, I think, October or November. I left my abuser in August. And so then a couple months went by, I was finally settled and got connected with a therapist. Started going, but we hadn't really started, what is it, CBT? Is that what it is? Behavioral therapy, yep, CBT. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, hadn't really started it yet, but I think by the time I, I posted my my post, we had started it, and um, and when the post went viral, you know, I had no idea that it was going to go viral, and and then creating the the Facebook group was amazing. We had thousands of followers and days, and I I was just extremely overwhelmed. I could hardly at that point, you know, when when you leave, I didn't work for three months. I, you know, spent so much time sleeping. Um, I had all of these symptoms, like I I was hyper vigilant, and I had a lot of nightmares and. Um, I, because I, I moved around a bit before I got settled, you know, I slept at different friends' houses and stuff, pretty much everywhere I slept, I had a dream that he was coming to get me at that location. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was not fun, but when I started trauma therapy, um, that was so vital and so important to uh, getting in control of all of those triggers and, and identifying them. So um, basically I, you know, posted the post, created the uh, group, basically a week later, I think I said, mom, I can't do this. My mom is a part of the group. And so she kind of took charge along with a lot of other women uh, that came out of the woodworks to help run the page uh, and keep it safe. And then, so I kind of 
pieced out. I wasn't on the page at all for a long time and focused on healing. I had like a part-time job, so I wasn't working very much, but it was enough to make it by. And this therapy that I went through was telling the worst story that happened to me, worst incident that happened with my ex over and over again until... Uh, so it basically it, it helps your brain process all the different points of the story because when you're in a very traumatic when you have a traumatic experience your brain checks out and goes into freeze fight or flight mode and you can have different you know moments of time when you when you freeze or when you flight or whatever it might be but but in the traumatic moment um, and afterwards your, your brain has shut off to that, that moment in order to protect itself. So you haven't processed anything that happened. And that's why it's so important to do trauma counseling because it helps you process, you know, there was things that he said to me, there was things that he did to me. There was very psychological, um, things that he did. He threatened to kill himself and, and that was all something that you know every part of the story I had to process and so once I had processed that the uh, nightmares went away I very rarely have a nightmare unless I talk about abuse a ton um, or talk about a specific story that I haven't you know thought about for forever and um, and all, the hyper alertness went away like that uh, a lot of people experience this hypervigilance where um they're constantly on edge and that's how I was I would you know hear a very distant sound and I thought it was people arguing and I get my heart races and and you know I start getting shaky I can't focus um and that was something that happened a lot and especially when I actually heard couples arguing there were several times when I heard uh, couples arguing in a parking lot or, or, you know, and, and I, I was so upset and enraged. Like I, I, well, not enraged, but like, I, I wanted to go find, like, I heard them in that, like, I heard it in my apartment one time and, yeah. and needed to go find whoever it was and make sure that she was okay or whatever. Cause he yeah. was calling, you know, anyways. So but now, like, if I sometimes at work, which is really random, we have like uh, people walk by, and sometimes I, I have actually heard at work people arguing quite a bit. <laughs> and so now I, you know, my heart doesn't race. I'm calm. I'm able to react in a way that um, would actually might be helpful. There's there was a time when a guy was parked right in front of our storefront and was yelling on his phone like arguing and, and calling I don't know what who he was talking to but I you know was able to peek my head out the door and be like dude <laughs> like yeah. and he was like he like uh realized what he was doing and like quieted down but I was like yeah you're crazy <laughs> but yeah so I was able to do that without you know having all of those PTSD symptoms that um, you have when you leave abusive relationships. So now that I, I finished, um, let's see here, I finished trauma therapy around um, July okay. and uh, my insurance had changed so I could no longer see that therapist and was trying to get connected with another therapist. Um, I had some uh, terrible roommate happenings, but uh, am now in a very safe place. I have an awesome roommate. I'm surrounded with friends. Um, and it's crazy to me to think that, you know, less than two years ago, I was in such a dark place, like, um, and un like truly unsafe place. They say that, uh, when your, um, uh, abuser, strangles you or um yeah uses strangulation against you chokes you you're 750 times more likely to um be murdered and that happened to me and so um 
now that I'm out and I can see how how dangerous it was, like the veil being pulled back, like I'm I'm just so thankful every day for where I am and I'm super healthy and happy now and and um, have a wonderful relationship with um, a boyfriend that I probably started dating a little bit too soon, but um, so wouldn't recommend, you know, dating soon after the abuse, but I actually knew him before I got married and, um, and I knew he was a very safe person. So, so that's why I kind of give myself a little bit of grace there, but <laughs> didn't really follow my own advice for other people, but, um, but he's amazing and has been so patient through like my healing journey. And, and yeah, so I have an amazing church and yeah. it's just like, there's so much happiness and and success and yeah safety once you're out of the relationship happiness success and safety i wrote down some notes there's a couple of things i want to touch on that i think are so important when yeah. you had to step back from the page i think it's really important for people to understand it's intense when you've experienced abuse it's intense and hearing about other people's abuse yeah. or hearing other people argue it brings up what we call, and I'm so glad you named it PTSD, right? CPTSD, specifically complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which can be acquired by being in an abusive situation. It, and it's not this ethereal concept of, oh, maybe this happens. No, you, you get PTSD when you've been in an abusive situation for long enough. And that's where the hypervigilance comes in, right? And the dreams, the nightmares that you've had. And so mm -hmm. I want to touch on that next part that's so important, which was you got good counseling. Yeah. You got with a qualified person who could help you walk through exactly what you needed to with the trauma therapy. Yeah. People can heal. On, you can heal from abuse on your own. But what I tend to see, and my purview is just my purview, right? This is not mm -hmm. empirically based on everything else in the world. But what I've mm -hmm. seen is... If you do not consciously heal, if you do not consciously understand yourself and what's going on with you, if you do not understand the situations that happened and process them like you did with a qualified person, and then if you don't set boundaries, et cetera, you're not going to heal. And instead, you're just going to rinse and repeat the cycle. Yeah. And a qualified professional, somebody can help you walk through that process. Or there are tons of books out there. If the books work for you, awesome, great. Sometimes you read a book and then you're like, okay, cool. Or sometimes you can't really pull out of it what you need to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. But you've got the right resources, which is so huge. And again, that's why the website is so good. Yeah. Yeah. And then you said you gave yourself grace. <laughs> I just yeah, posted... Not only boyfriend thing but in a lot of different scenarios like it's so important to be like kind to yourself because in your healing journey it's not a destination it's like a journey and and there are hills and valleys in it and so there were weeks that went by where I just felt like I wasn't making any progress or I was super uh, in my head about things and um, and then, you know, there was weeks where I felt completely healed and never thought I would, you know, experience a PTSD, you know, symptom again. But the the reality of it is, is that like it, like different things will kind of continually come up. And, and that doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're going to be dealing with these horrible things forever. It's, it's actually now that I have, you know, eradicated most of the, the, hypervigilance or the nightmares and stuff like that um when a trigger does come up it might be uh uncomfortable you know in the moment and having to talk to whoever it might be like a friend or or uh, my boyfriend about whatever the trigger was but it's so much more powerful and enlightening like afterwards like figuring out oh like i'm i've been feeling that way because i was told this like over and over again yeah so that's a good recognition be kind to yourself. <laughs> be kind give yourself grace that's yeah yeah one more thing i want to touch on 
uh, based on what you said. Sorry, but go ahead. I want you to finish that. Is there more? Oh, I was just going to say, like, you're going to make mistakes, too. Like, I, there's something that I had to uh, actually really work through afterwards was I, I kind of had a problem with some, um, some friends, and I was told that I only talked about myself like I I am um, and so that was a moment for me where I had to step back and realize you know I've kind of been in this like victim uh, mindset uh, and it was all about kind of what I was doing and my healing journey and it, they didn't feel like I was investing in in their relationship so I kind of had to yeah realize that and give myself grace and apologize so a couple of things i want to talk about with that so you said you slept a lot and i want anybody who watches this to understand that is a wonderful thing you've got to practice self-care when you're mm -hmm. healing from abuse and even beyond as hannah said when you think you're healed when you think you're good right there'll be times that things come over you you give yourself grace don't judge it acknowledge mm -hmm. it for what it is recognize that it's there and that's perfect what you did with your friends. Okay, let's see. Let's find the truth in this. Rather yeah. than get hurt, rather than go into a shell, let's find the truth in this. Let's see what's going on and apologize for what I need to and move on. And I also love that you talked about you were in that victim mentality. I don't use the word victim too often. I try to avoid it as much as I can. And what I say is somebody yeah. who has experienced abuse. Because mm -hmm. if we call it a victim, you've been victimized. And then, mm. then something was done to you, which abuse is. But I don't want people to stay there. You did this to me. But rather right. what I want people to experience is, yes, that was a terrible situation. And somebody did something they shouldn't have done. But that's not the story. The story right. is, then I healed from that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. Um, I think... I think that's like a really important distinction with the word victim because I, unfortunately, I think victim has like a lot of negative connotations with it yeah. and, you know, abusers can't like, like victimize themselves. And so that's, oh, that's obviously negative and a negative trait. And so, um, yeah, I like the, the people who have been abused rather than the victim. Um, like terminology and, and words are like so important in the way you label people. And so, yeah. yeah. I really <laughs> and as you were talking, I don't remember what brought this up, but the, the education piece or something like that brought this up. There was one time I was working on the course a couple of months ago and it was deep stuff. And I had this feeling, share this with Jake, my oldest son. I was mm -hmm. like, Really? Because this is like, this is the deep stuff, really. This is the not pretty stuff. And I had the feeling, share this with him. So I called him in. I said, hey, Jake, take a look at what I'm working on right now. He's like, okay, cool. A couple months later, a couple weeks later, I don't remember what it was, is he and his girlfriend were painting in his room and she was on a folding chair and the chair fell and she fell down and landed right on her elbow. So they had to go to the emergency room Oh no. Yeah, I know, right? They go to the emergency <sighs> room. Luckily, she is okay. There's nothing broken, whatever. As they're coming back from the emergency room, there's a car parked on the side of the road, and he just had a feeling that something wasn't right, whatever. And so he was slowing down to maybe check him out. And as soon as he did, they veered right in front of him and sped off. He said it was kind of weird. Um. So we just no, drove normally but happened to then be side by side and I could see the dude yelling at the girl just absolutely livid ripping right into her and mm -hmm. so he knew that there was a problem so he kind of tailed them he called 911 let them know what was going on and he said if you hadn't shared that stuff with me I probably wouldn't have been attuned to that yeah and I was I was grateful because I was like well good I wouldn't have shared it with you if I didn't have that feeling but yeah it really highlights, and we don't need to scare people. We don't need to like throw them this whole ugly underbelly because you and I know this ugly underbelly that other people who haven't been up close don't understand. And we don't need to right give them all that, but those who have experienced it, you know it, you sense it. Yeah. But we do need to help people understand that there's more to it when a couple is arguing in public and one of them looks like they look. They have that deer in the headlights look, or one of them is absolutely unhinged. There's more to that story, and 
And if we can be a little bit more aware of those things, not that yeah. we need to step in because usually that doesn't go well. The abuser doesn't like that. I've done it several times. Uh, when I've heard different things or seen people arguing, I'll ask, is, is everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. And typically they'll either downplay it or they'll like mind your own business. And like, yeah. I don't know if, if you're like being not nice, that's kind of my business. So mm -hmm. anyway, I, I think that's so important. So what yeah. else, what else do you want people to know, Hannah? <laughs> what else? Oh gosh. I don't know. There's something that came to mind and then I lost it. Hmm. If I can remember it. Yeah. Had something to do with, um, telling people, but yeah, I love, I love that you, um, talk to your son about that because I think that it's so important like the not just um yeah showing a a healthy relationship but speaking it out and saying when things are not okay mm -hmm. is is really important um I think that like children's brains are you know developing and and when they get into relationships like middle and high school it's just like a time when they learn that certain things are are normal or or certain things uh you know another thing that I was learning about like I have no idea how to teach children necessarily so I I really like with these pdfs really tried to research because I don't have kids and and the the elementary school, you know, I have a lot of friends that have little kids, you know, five to eight years old. And, and so I kind of felt like I knew that from being around them, like how to teach them consent and stuff like that. But with the middle school and high school, I was like, I was like, I need all the information I can get. But the middle school was interesting. They were, they were talking about on these different websites that I was looking at talking about how it's normal for you know guys to um slap other guys butts or or girls to get their bras you know like uh straps uh, pulled uh, snapped and and there's a lot of things that that happen at those ages that aren't consensual like aren't okay yeah. um and you know bowling obviously starts and so there's just so many things that um a, a child like learns is and they think it's normal um so yeah, yeah i think it's really awesome that that you spoke to how old is he 18 18 yeah Dang. and the two younger kids cannot watch a video or a movie with me anymore without going oh that's manipulation right there or, <laughs> <laughs> that means a narcissist, right? And I, my, as you mentioned, the bra straps getting pinched and that kind of thing. My 13 year old is feisty, feisty. And she knows what's okay, what's not okay. She knows what consent is. And, and, and so again, this is why I'm so glad that you're teaching this because as you noted, people like me, we clean up the mess. People who have been in abusive situations, helping them recognize it, helping them understand what's really happening, put the name to it helping them move towards setting boundaries so that the abuse stops occurring or they can live however they want to live. Right. I would, yeah. everybody has to make their own decision, but at least enabling them to understand if you don't want to be abused anymore, here are some boundaries and here's what boundaries yeah. look like and, and then move toward that healing. But what you're doing again with the website, speak your truth today, not only are there resources for people who need to understand what abuse is and recover from abuse and hear other people's stories, but there's also those resources to help the kids and yeah. it's so vital that prevent that uh preventation is what i was about to yeah. say uh the uh, prevention yeah can't talk anymore <laughs> nowadays I was trying so to say cyclical the other day and i couldn't say cyclical i was like sick <laughs> anyway, so that preventation is so important <laughs> so good. Oh, i have one word that i really struggle with photography for some yeah. reason, I always say photography. Like, I don't know why. That's good. <laughs> I always yeah. read it like that, so. <laughs> photography. Yeah, if you say words, I used to be able to spell English really well, but then I learned German, and German is this crazy language where you actually spell things the same way you say them. I mean, it's like wild. Huh. So now I can't spell English anymore. It's That's really funny. <laughs> 
All right, so I want to wrap this up. What I've done is I've made time markers here. So I'm going to point people to the various time markers throughout the video about when we talked about different things. Yeah. Hannah, I love and adore you because you spoke your truth. You put yourself out there vulnerably because you wanted to help other people. And you didn't know what was going to come. You had no idea it would go viral and has been reached by tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands by now. It had to have been because it's been shared how many thousands of times? Yeah, I think 123,000 times. Yeah. Shares. 123,000 shares, which means four times that, five times that or more have seen that post. You have raised such awareness for this. And then, like I said, you didn't anticipate everything that came and you have graciously stepped into that role, the unofficial spokesperson here for domestic abuse and helping people throughout the world recognize it, understand about it, and now like we're talking about with the prevention of it. I really appreciate all that you're doing. You're my buddy, and I love and I <laughs> Love you too. No, it's like such a privilege, honestly, to be able to, and it's so healing for me as well. That's something that I always talk about, the page. It's not only healing for the survivors to talk to the people who are in it, still experiencing abuse, but it's it's healing for, wait, how did I say that? Healing for the people that are in it, it's healing for the survivors, you know, that, that are also um, bestowing their advice and wisdom. And so this whole page and group and website has been like another part of my own healing journey so um so as much as you know people have been uh helped by me speaking out like i have been i always encourage everyone just it's so important to to speak out what you have experienced yeah the trauma that you've experienced because because when you're vulnerable it allows other people to be vulnerable so exactly right uh, but yeah. as we mentioned on the facebook live if you're in the middle of an abusive situation do not be vulnerable with your abuser that only yeah. opens you up to more abuse what hannah's talking about is when you're ready to speak your truth being vulnerable with those who can help you being vulnerable with those who get it yeah so important. yeah, yeah. hannah this is <laughs> awesome so the new website, speakyourtruth.today, and mm -hmm. other resources available at stopemotionalabuse.net. Mm -hmm. Connect with us. Connect to the Facebook page. Anybody that's not already, Speak Your Truth is the Facebook page. You have to answer some questions so that we can vet and make sure that you've got good intentions. But anybody who needs the help is more than welcome there. Anything yeah. else, Hannah, you want to talk about? <laughs> I don't think so. I just really appreciate you wanting to interview me and, and I just like your um, website, uh, stopemotionalabuse.net and your courses have been like so vital to, to our little Facebook group community. So I really appreciate you. <laughs> Brandon.